A while ago, Ezo released the new Loxon 5 Nano DCC sound decoder. Let's see how it compares to the older Loxon 5 Micro and how the installation process works out. Ezo specifies the new Nano as 8.5mm wide. This makes it more narrow than the older Micro and means that it is narrow enough to fit inside your typical road switcher engine shell without making any modifications. The Loxound 5 Micro required sanding the inside of the shell because it was just a little bit too wide to fit. With a length of 19.6mm it's a bit shorter than the Micro. The height is specified as 3.2mm. This measurement has ruffled some feathers as it only includes the decoder as such and does not take the breakout board with the wire connections into account. With the breakout board the Nano requires a bit more vertical space and more importantly requires this space for the entire length of the decoder. Together with the breakout board the total required height of the package is about 4.5mm. This may not seem like much but inside an N-scale engine this is quite a big difference. For this project I selected an older Atlas High Hood SD24 model. The high hood and the relatively long wheelbase help with the installation. At the same time the light conductors seem to be glued into the shell so making more room by modifying the light conductors is a bit of a problem. I decided to put the decoder in the front while the speaker and the small keep alive capacitor go in the back of the engine. With low hood variants it's probably easier to put the decoder in the back and have the speaker in the cab of the engine like I did with the Lock Sound micro installation in a GP35 model a while ago. This frame already has enough room so I didn't need to modify the frame halves like I had to do with all the frames. However I needed to short the light conductor leading to the headlight. Because the headlight and number board were glued into the shell I had to break the light conductor off while it was installed and then file the surface a bit to get a good contact spot for the LED later on. I also had to rewire the wire harness or at least I felt I had to because it comes with the wires pointing to the outside from the factory and I was a little worried that they might catch and get squeezed against the frame by the shell. With the preparations of the shell done, it's time to make sure that the decoder does not create any shorts against the frame. I used 9mm wide captain tape to insulate the decoder from the frame, pushing it into the corners of the frame with a toothpick to get good adhesion so the tape does not come loose again in the next steps. To check that the decoder can't accidentally connect with the metal of the frame, I test with the decoder in its insulation location. Another important point for additional insulation is the area around the motor contacts. This engine had a regular DCC decoder installed in the past so it already had captain tape applied in that area. Before soldering the motor connections I connected the decoder to the rail contacts. To do so I used a small piece of the old light board so I had good solder pads available. Then I placed the decoder in its insulation position to get an idea of the required cable length and shortened the leads for the rail connections to the correct length. After removing the insulation from the wires and pre-tinning them, I soldered the rail connections to their respective pads. The red wire on the decoder connects to the right rail and the black wire connects to the left rail. After the rail connections had been made, I repeated the same steps for the motor connections. Here the orange wire goes to the right connection tab on the motor and the grey wire goes to the left tab. After these four connections have been made, you can do a short test if you want to. Most decoders are programmed to address 3 from the factory. Just make sure to insulate all unconnected wires and maybe tape the decoder in place to avoid costly accidents. The motor should now respond to drive commands from the DCC system. The next step then are the connections to the speaker. I wanted to place the speaker as far back as possible to provide room for a couple of capacitors while still staying clear of the real light conductor. The Zemo speakers I used have spring loaded connection tabs. I cut those off to reduce the risk of them pushing up against the shell when everything is in place. While soldering the wires from the decoder to the speaker I used a pair of capacitors as spacer. At this point there are already a lot of connections made but nothing is secured in place which makes the installation work more difficult so I taped the speaker in place to have less moving parts. Now it's time to build a little power pack. Having this is not strictly necessary but I feel some extra keep alive potential makes the entire engine run just a little bit smoother and reduces instances of the sound cutting out. 
I used four Tantel capacitors wired in parallel for a total capacity of 400 microfarad and a Zener diode to protect them from voltage spikes, since dying Tantel capacitors like to go out with actual fire involved. The capacitors I used are rated for 20 volts, so I chose a Zener diode with a breakdown voltage of 20 volts. Polarity of the capacitors and of the diode is important. If you are using Tentel capacitors, the lines on the capacitors and the diode need to be on the same side of the power pack. If you are unsure, check the datasheets of the parts you are using. When the power pack is assembled, it also needs to be wired up to the correct connections on the decoder. The side with a line on the diode needs to go to the blue wire on the decoder. This wire is the supply voltage line of the decoder. The other side of the pack needs to be connected to the ground connection of the decoder. Most decoders don't have a dedicated ground wire attached to them, but the adapter board of the Locksound Nano has two big ground solder pads you can use. Before making the connection to the ground pads, I wrapped the power pack into captain type to insulate it against the frame. I had removed the extra wires from the function outputs I did not intend to use earlier and reused one of those wires for the ground connection. After another quick test to check if the sound and everything else is actually working, the last remaining connections were to the headlights and the rotary beacon. I used LEDs with a 1 kilo ohm SMD resistor for all of them. I like to use resistors in a 1206 type housing, because they are small but still large enough to work with easily. Pre-tinning the contacts of the SMD resistor helps a lot and locking tweezers help a lot to keep the resistor in place while pre-tinning the contacts. In order to minimize the number of the required wires, it's important to understand how the current flows from the decoder to the LEDs. Despite being called function outputs, the outputs don't actually provide the power to the LEDs, but rather provide a path to ground, allowing power to flow and thus making the LED turn on. The power is provided by the blue wire on the decoder. That's why the anode of the LEDs need to be connected to the blue wire on the decoder. If you buy your LEDs pre-wired, the anode typically has a red wire connected to it. I connected the anode of the rear headlight to the power pack on the side that already had the blue wire connection to it, so I didn't need to run another wire. I connected the cathode of the LED, which typically has a black wire attached to it, to one contact of the SMD resistor and then slid a short piece of shrink tubing over it. I then connected the other side of the resistor to the corresponding function output wire and shrank the tubing down with the soldering iron. As a final step, I glued the LEDs to the beacon and the headlight light conductors from the inside and put the shell back on. I hope this was helpful. See you next time.